Okay, thank you very much. It's good to be here to be able to make a presentation in person. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, uh, today I'll try to defend a rather provocative view. Uh, in the upshot of my talk is, uh, is simply this. I'll try to show that it's possible to reduce uh, abductive uh, reasoning or inference uh, to the best explanation, which is a particular case of abduction, which is very much used to, to defend the scientific realism, thus to reduce uh, uh, abduction to uh, deductive reasoning. That is, uh, to a deductive or a special kind of deductive reasoning in the sense that uh, it has as uh, one of its crucial premises a, uh, an inductively empirically confirmed uh, causal, causal statement. A causality will be understood in the, in the million sense, I mean, the John Stuart Mill's uh, sense. Okay. So here's the uh, menu. I'll shortly uh, <laughs> remind you, but sorry for those of you who already know where I stand uh, as a philosopher of science. So I will be briefly explain what I believe philosophy of science is. I also then discuss some popular virtues of theories and the ones which uh, uh, have been considered to be truth tropic by some scientific realists and especially explanatory virtues. And I'll show that explanatory virtues are not too conducive. Then I'll briefly present the bottom up strategy in favor of scientific realism uh, and uh, then uh, a conclusion. So, what do I believe uh, uh, philosophy of science to be? First of all, I, I'll focus on the products of scientific activity and not on scientific activity itself. I know that it's very fashionable nowadays, uh, nowadays to adopt a uh, pragmatic attitude in philosophy of science, uh, to, to uh, start from the practice uh, of scientists, scientific practice, uh, historically uh, uh, situated or present day uh, uh, scientific uh, practice, and then to try to draw philosophical conclusions from that. I don't, do not adopt that uh, perspective. I will focus on the products of scientific the of uh, scientific activity, namely theories. So, it's a classical approach, but it's not very uh, much uh, uh, practiced uh, today. So I call that approach contemplative, uh, like uh, you know, Plato would say, for example. Uh, uh, so uh, I try to contemplate the. Uh, the theories and to see what are the virtues, in this case, what the virtues of those theories which are truth conducive and truth tropic. And I adopt uh, an empiricist, rather empiricist, a rather strict empiricist, but not too strict uh, approach in philosophy, but which is not naturalistic. So I'm not a naturalist philosopher. I don't think philosophy of science is science. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that. I'm just you know, stating, uh, we, can, we can go back to that in the discussion if you wish, but just stating that I believe very bluntly that uh, science is descriptive, whereas philosophy of science and philosophy in general is normative. It has to do with the good and the bad, with some values. So I, I'll try to find out which are good arguments in favor of scientific uh, realism. Okay. So the philosophical question I'll address here is the following. What are the characteristics or the, the qualities of a scientific theory which uh, give us uh, better reasons to believe that some parts of the theory or some propositions of statements of the of the theory are true or are more likely to be true. 
So, of course, the brief answer is this as an empiricist is that perceptual experience is king. That's the, uh, the main uh, bottom line that we, uh, we have to base uh, our uh, philosophical claims on, uh, on, on, on experience. So I defend a version of scientific realism, which is epistemological and uh, uh, which I formulate in this way. The arguments in favor of our belief in the existence or reality of some unobserved entities or things. And I take entities and things to be uh, sets or uh, bundles of instantiated properties. So a table, for example, is a set of instantiated properties. A table functions, the word table functions as a, an abbreviation uh, of a open set of characteristics like being hard, being stable, being uh, having four legs and things like that. So uh, what are the arguments? What are the good arguments? Uh, and also the bad arguments, uh, which uh, entitle us to believe that uh, some things which are unobserved exist, and also the truth of some propositions about those entities. Okay, so are there arguments which give us better reasons? Huh? Not cogent reasons in the sense that <coughs> we would be obliged to uh, on the basis of those arguments to believe in the reality. It's not, of course, irrational not to believe in the existence of unobserved entities. And anti-realist philosophers are not irrational. So it's important to, for me, I think, uh, in general, and also in general, to show that there are better arguments. There are more reasons. It's more rational uh, to believe uh, in the existence of some entities and some propositions about unobserved entities, rather than not believing in them or suspend our belief about them. Suspend belief uh, is a kind of atheistic, as Van Vassen would say, atheistic position, which is uh, uh, suspension of belief, agnostic, sorry, it's an agnostic position, and atheistic position would be, well, those unobserved entities do not exist. Okay. So uh, I'm against a, a, a skeptical attitude with respect to scientific theories uh, in the sense that uh, uh, I will try to show that we have good <coughs> reasons to believe that some parts of our best theories are, are true. Okay, so in practice, uh, uh, specifically, we have more reasons to believe in the existence of, say, protons and bacteria than uh, not. Okay. Now, some popular virtues of theories that show, of course, it's empirical adequacy. Empirical adequacy is, uh, is this very briefly. A theory is empirically adequate if, if it uh, saves phenomena. It saves phenomena, but uh, um, empirical adequacy in a restricted sense, not all possible phenomena that could be uh, uh, discovered in the future, but empirically, empirically adequate now. That is, the predictions of a theory so far, uh, as we know, are correct or more or less correct. This is, of course, a necessary but not sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition for uh, be able to defend uh, scientific realism about uh, some specific uh, theories. But uh, we have the standard argument against uh, the, the, the position which would say, well, a theory is empirically adequate, that's fine. And then, therefore, the, uh, the parts of the theory, at least, that allow us to make the uh, empirical predictions which are successful, those parts are, are true. And, uh, but uh, the uh, standard argument is the and the determination it is always possible that another empirically equivalent equivalent theory, empirically equivalent theory, uh, saves the same phenomena. Um, it's easy to show that uh, either in a semantic approach or the uh, syntactic approach, that it is always possible to construct alternative theories which are equally empirically adequate. 
So it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient empirical, empirical adequacy. We need more than empirical adequacy to defend uh, some version of scientific uh, realism. Another virtue is the uh, empirical scope. That is the wider the scope, the empirical sto scope of a theory, uh, uh, the better the theory is, of course, that, uh, that's, it's, a, it's a virtue. But again, uh, the uh, underdetermination under thesis comes uh, into the picture and doesn't uh, allow us to uh, choose or to decide that a given theory among those which are empirically adequate is at least partially uh, and approximately the true one. Simplicity, well, simplicity, it's also a virtue of a theory. We prefer, we prefer theories that are simple to theories which are more complicated. In fact, this is a pragmatic virtue, and the pragmatic virtue uh, doesn't have any uh, truth purchase, uh, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, uh, the main reason is, and we'll come back to this several times, there is no uh, reason to believe that nature is, is simple according to our criteria of simplicity. So even if we managed to agree on what is simplicity, which is not uh, that clear, as you know, uh, we um, still, there is no warrant, there is no guarantee that uh, this, this, this virtue of simplicity um, connects with external reality. There is no a priori reason to believe that our simplicity requirements, are subjective, collectively subjective requirements of simplicity, what we like, you know, uh, simplicity to be a uh, corresponds to something real. Or in other words, nature is not necessarily, does not necessarily comply with our subjective requirements. Okay. Now, if a theory contains inductively confirmed causal laws, <coughs> Then that's a, that will be the chief virtue besides empirical adequacy that I will uh, try to show that it is truth conducive. Uh, of course, I will have to specify what it means for law to be causal. But if we have causal laws, I mean, if a theory contains causal laws, then with the help of those laws and from actually observed uh, observed effects, we can deductively infer the existence of causes that are observable in principle. So from observed phenomena and causal laws which are inductively and empirically confirmed, then it's possible to uh, defend the existence of some uh, causes which are observable in principle, but not yet perhaps uh, observed. And then, if this works, we do not need to resort to inference to the best uh, explanation or abduction. Okay. And this is the position I'll try to argue for. Now, most, uh, most scientific realists, uh, as, you, as you know, they um, defend the, uh, an explanatory strategy. That is, if a theory explains well or even better, provides a better explanation in any sense, of course, then you have to agree or so on what counts as a good explanation, which is not that uh, easy to do, but let's suppose that uh, it's possible to have some agreement on what's a better or a good explanation. Then, between competing theories, uh, empirically equivalent theories, which are equally, uh, equally good at saving phenomena, you, could, you would be in a position, according to those realists, you would be in, position, in a position to assert that the parts of a theory which, of a theory which gives it 
better explanation, more explanatory power than another one, but this one, this one, this theory, which better explanatory power is more likely to be true than another competing theory, which is empirically equivalent. Okay? Um, so, an empirically adequate theory that explains better the observed phenomena is more likely to be partially true than a competing theory which explains them in a less satisfactory way. And the selected parts of the theory, of course, scientific realism is always a selective thesis. You, you cannot, uh, uh, by means of uh, uh, general arguments, defend that uh, the whole and uh, the whole statements that are contained in a theory are true or approximately true. So the selected parts of the theory which play an essential role, which are indispensable uh, uh, in the explanation of some phenomena, are more likely to be true. So that's probably the kind of argument which is very simplified, kind of argument which is usually um, proposed by scientific realists is the explanatory 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 uh, uh, power. So what, what are the problems with this kind of defense of scientific realism? But there is a first a problem, what counts as a good explanation? Okay, so I mentioned, just mentioned that. The second problem, uh, what are the reasons to believe that a good explanation, in whatever sense uh, of good explanation, what are the reasons to believe that a good explanation is truth tropic or truth conducive? That is, well, let's suppose that uh, uh, we have a, 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 an empirically adequate theory. It explains uh, a phenomena. It's empirically adequate. It explains better uh, the phenomena than some other theory. Well, do we have reason to believe that the, the theory, which are more explanatory power, is true? What would be the grounds, or the empirical grounds, as an empiricist? What would be the empirical grounds uh, 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 to to um, to defend uh, this view? Okay. And this is, of course, have been uh, pointed out by several empiricist uh, philosophers, notably uh, Pascal Frasser. Now we have to make. To go further, we have to make important distinctions. Uh, this is a distinction that Peter Lipton, Peter Lipton in his book, uh, Inference to the Best Explanation, uh, has, been made, uh, has made clear. An explanation is lovely if it complies with our requirements of what counts as a good explanation. Uh, good, typically, a good explanation is uh, an explanation which provides comprehension, understanding, and uh, again, this this notion of loveliness is uh, is fishy, but that doesn't really matter as as I will as we will show for the for the next for what follows. You you can choose any. Uh, Philosophical account of explanation, then the argument uh, which follows works works as well. Now, an explanation is likely if it is likely to be true. So, what are the reasons to believe that the loveliest explanation is also the likeliest? So let me quote Lipton here. What reason is there to believe that the explanation that would be the loveliest, if it were true, that, that's an important uh, um, insert in this quotation that by Lipton, is also the explanation which is the more likely to be true. Why should we believe that we inhabit the loveliest of all possible worlds? Okay. I would take the word if it were true out of the, uh, of the quotation. Because it's important to, to separate very clearly, very sharply, the internal property of loveliness. The internal property of loveliness. Why is it an internal property? Because the explanatory power of theory is an internal characteristic, uh, is an, is an internal characteristic of a theory. It is the uh, architecture or the organization, the intrinsic 
uh, made up of the theory which makes it, uh, um, according to some criteria, a better explanatory theory than another one. So explanatory power is an in internal virtue of, uh, of theories. On one hand, likeliness, that is likely, is the theory likely to be true? That's an external, that's an external characteristic. Because truth, well, at least in the correspondence view, uh, which I tend to favor, uh, the truth is something which is external. The truth of the theory doesn't, uh, is not an inter internal characteristic of, of the theory. It depends on phenomena and things out there, so to speak. So the argument, the, 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 the argument, uh, the abductive argument, uh, the explanatory strategy, the inference to the best explanation, is an argument which is supposed to go from an internal theory, an internal property of a theory, namely its, ex, its explanatory power, that is its loveliness, to uh, an external quality of a theory, namely its being at least partially and approximately true. Okay? That's the, that's, that's the argument. Huh? And, uh, uh, and here I follow uh, Lipton, we have Voltaire's uh, objection. So you you remember uh, Candide, uh, uh, Voltaire. Voltaire uh, ironically criticizes uh, Leibniz, uh, who defended that we live in, in the best of possible worlds because uh, uh, God is good and all powerful, and then he chose to create the best of uh, all logically possible uh, worlds. And then you have this uh, famous sentence by Candide uh, uh, in, in the book by Voltaire, Tout est pour le mieux dans le meilleur des mondes. And then he shows that, of course, there are many uh, there are, uh, earthquakes and uh, Lisbon earthquake uh, made a very deep impression on Voltaire. And, uh, uh, of course, there are many, many problems in this world and many tragedies and things like that. So it seems a bit uh, 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 boastful or audacious to defend that everything to be put a point mieux dans le meilleur des mondes. But the point, of course, uh, of the argument is that there is, because uh, Leibniz's argumentation is, uh, is a priori, of course, it's a, it's a idealist uh, argumentation, there is, there is no an empirical reason to believe that external reality complies with our uh, human uh, or scientist or collectively scientist requirements of what counts as a good explanation. There is no reason that uh, the reality has to comply with what we like, uh, what, what we love, what we love. Uh, to, 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 to be coherent with the, with the terminology we have adopted uh, uh, here, okay? I think that's a very strong argument against any kind of explanatory strategy, any kind of explanatory strategy. Whatever, you know, whatever philosophical account, I repeat, whatever philosophical account of uh, explanation you have, okay, it's an internal property of a theory, and then why does the external world, does the external uh, world would have to comply with those uh, uh, explanatory requirements. Okay, and in particular, uh, this Voltaire's objection applies to the favorite argument mobilized by a scientific realist, namely the no miracle argument, uh, Putnam's no miracles argument, which is briefly, we, we do know that, which is briefly the following, that uh, science is successful, empirically successful, it manages to, scientific theory managed to successfully predict uh, uh, phenomena, future phenomena as well, and then it would be kind of a, a miracle, it would be a miracle if uh, those theories were not at least partially, partially, partially true, or partially true. That's a, that's a the typical example of inference to the best explanation. Here, there is only one reasonable explanation, uh, only one reasonable explanation, why the theory must be true, or at least approximately true, otherwise they wouldn't have success. 
Well, okay, but empirical, empirical adequacy, success here is empirical adequacy. Empirical adequacy is no guarantee uh, of, uh, of, uh, of truth because of the anti-determination uh, objection. Okay. And by the way, Putnam says that uh, this argument, the numerical argument, is a, is a, a naturalistic argument, it's a scientific argument in favor of scientific realism, but truth is certainly not a scientific concept. Okay. Truth is not, is not the same status as an electron or a proton or a bacteria. Or bacteria. Uh, so I think it's a, there is no reason to believe that this, of course it has some empirical basis, right? Some empirical basis. Because if you accept that science is by and large successful, I know sometimes it doesn't work, but uh, theories are falsified after all sometimes. But even if we we accept that empirical basis as the, the, the you know the broad success of science, uh, the explanation if we if we want a scientific explanation of this, well we cannot I think resort to the concept of truth, which is not uh, like positing the existence of unobserved entities and things like that uh, to explain to explain uh, uh, phenomena. So instead of this. Uh, explanatory approach to defend scientific realism, I defend uh, an inductive approach, which uh, it's bottom up, which starts from, from experience, whereas uh, the uh, objective strategy are top down, are top down, because what you do in, in the objective or inference to the best explanation argument, you consider a set of possible explanations of a given set of a given of given phenomena. So uh, you have several competing theories, OK? And uh, uh, up there, you know, which are uh, at the top, so to speak. And then you pick up the one which you believe has the greatest explanatory power, OK? The, this one, ah, this one is the true one. So this is a, a, a top-down explanation. Whereas a bottom-up bottom explanation is a strategy we start with phenomena, causal relationships, uh, as I'll try to show, causal empirically proven relationships, and then allow uh, you to infer the existence of unobserved causes of the phenomena. So you start from the effects, and you you go up to the to the causes. Whereas in the top down approach, you start from the theories, alternative theories. You you pick up the one which has the best explanatory power, and then you say, oh, this one is the is the true explanation of phenomena. Okay. So what's the bottom up uh, inductive strategy in favor of empirical scientific realism? Well, first of all, uh, we have to make uh, uh, another important distinction between properties that are observable in principle, OP properties, on the one hand, and purely theoretical properties, PT, PT, uh, PT properties, purely theoretical properties, PT properties. Now, the properties that are observable in principle are of course the directly observable properties like uh, hardness, uh, things like that. And also uh, detectable properties. The, the detectable properties in my terminology are observable properties which are indirectly observationally accessible by means of instruments which improve our perceptual abilities, typically the telescope but, uh, or the microscope but other, other instruments uh, are, like, are like that uh, too. And uh, I already said that here, but I repeat for those who don't know this uh, rather controversial uh, thesis, properties such as mass, charge, temperature, uh, many, many properties which occur in the scientific theories, not all, uh, properties which are uh, referred to in scientific theories are observable in principle, like mass, why, 
Uh, well, the objection, of course, it's a well-known objection. The terms, uh, mass, quote, unquote, uh, uh, the terms mass charge, etc., are theory laden. They, they, they are defined. They, they, they are defined. Their meanings are defined uh, in the context of theories, and the meanings have been determined after a long historical process. Uh, typically, temperature. Uh, you have a beautiful discussion of temperature, for example, in uh, uh, um, uh, Anfassen's book *Scientific Representation*. Well. But once we understood, we have understood those terms. Uh, we have understood those terms. Typically, when we have had we had the training in, in science or in physics or in biology, we understand the meaning of the terms, and then we are able to apply this, those terms in uh, perceptual empirical situations. Uh, for example, temperature. For temperature, you can if you if you have a kettle uh, uh, on the with boiling water in it, then and in, in, in the kitchen, then you you can touch the the, the t a table in the kitchen, and then you can touch if you if you are daring, uh, you touch the kettle. You can say, oh, this kettle has a higher temperature. Huh? So you do not observe the temperature as such as you can observe hardness, but you can claim on the basis of very simple experiences that. The temperate, that the temperature of some objects is higher than the temperature of another object. Huh? When, 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 when you have a grasp of the concept of temperature. So a statement, statement such as the temperature of the, the kettle is higher than the temperature of the table huh, in the kitchen, that's a, a, a true statement which can be buttressed the truth, but the, the, the belief in its truth can be betrayed by very simple, immediate experiences. Of course, our senses are crude, but uh, they are uh, the basis uh, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, or even scientific assertions. Because when you use instruments to measure temperature, to to, to you you check the the precision of those instruments by comparison by comparison with with uh, with uh, uh, your uh, your your uh, uh, immediate experiences in the first place, and then you you, you verify also the, if different uh, measuring devices that you can read you can read uh, of course by your senses you can read give approximately approximately the same measurements. So I think the reliability reliability of instruments also is based on immediate. Uh, experience at the end of the day. Okay. Of course, this is a very broad. Huh? I'm trying to be an empiricist as much as I can, <laughs> but uh, many empiricists would certainly bark uh, at this uh, this kind of contention. So it's a very broad, uh, it's an extended uh, uh, conception of uh, uh, observable, observable uh, uh, properties. Uh, then the purely theoretical properties, but in a sense, all properties are theoretical because they are denoted by theoretical, theoretical terms, the terms that belong to a scientific theory. And uh, if a, a term occurs in a scientific theory, it's, al it's always theoretical in that sense. But uh, uh, there are terms in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, scientific the theory which denotes entities which do not have uh, observ observable properties, even in the broad sense. In the broad sense, an electron, an electron has a mass and a charge, which are observable in principle, in, in my sense. Huh? But uh, uh, there are uh, other properties which are not, which are not observable even in principle. I mean the spin. The internal spin of an electron, that's not observable in principle. It's not like uh, uh, turning on spinning on itself, huh? okay? the spin of the electron. But uh, charge, strangeness, uh, in the elementary particle physics, you have uh, several examples of those purely theoretical properties. So PT mm -hmm. properties are beyond our observational reach 
as purely theoretical, they are observationally transcendent, they transcend the domain of, of the observability. So the claim I, I try to defend is that we have more reasons, more reasons to believe in the reality of observable properties that are directly or indirectly uh, observed, that is detected. Huh? Um, in order to be able, you know that in the discussions uh, on scientific realism, people speak a lot about observable and unobservable properties, which is very deaf, of course. But I think it's important to realize that you, 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 it's not enough to, 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 for a theory to be observable, to claim that it exists, you must also observe actually them. Huh? They must have been ob actually observed. It's not, it's not a mere possibility. Uh, so, to have a good case in favor of belief uh, in the existence or reality of an observable property must be really observed or indirectly observed, that is, detected. Okay. Detected, that is, by means of instruments, and those instruments typically work on the basis of causal laws. That might be ignored. Huh? The typical example that I, I often use is that uh, 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 when uh, Galileo claimed that uh, there are, were uh, mountains uh, and lakes uh, on, on the moon, uh, everybody quickly agrees. Huh? Uh, even Arist even the hard-nosed Aristotelian, they, they agree on the observations even if they didn't know about the laws of the telescope at the time. They agree. That doesn't mean that the Aristotelians bought the new philosophy defended by Galileo, because they, they, had, they introduced ad hoc hypotheses like the, the moon is within a hard crystalline uh, sphere, etc. So finally, those lakes and mountains, they were uh, motionless, immobile, and this was uh, a way of saving the immutability of the, of the skies. But you can easily check the reliability of a telescope by means of a simple ex uh, earthly mundane ex experiments, huh? when you see a, a, a ship uh, in the telescope and then you see that the ship has three masts, for example, then the ship come, comes close to the harbor and then you see, oh, bingo, huh? the, the ship does have the three masts that you saw uh, in the telescope. So even if you don't know the laws, uh, you can assert the, the, the reliability of, uh, 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 of an instrument that, that there are some uh, causal uh, uh, connections. Okay, if you cannot do that, if you cannot do that, if you cannot uh, uh, verify those causal connections, then uh, um, do you have no reason to believe uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, these causal connections obtain? And you can only do that if you deal with properties which are observable in principle. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay. So, in, indirectly observed properties are properties which are causally connected to immediately observed properties. And the existence of a causal connection must be attested by previously inductively verified causal generalizations or laws that mention observable properties only. Of course, you, you, you can verify a, a law only if those laws connect causes that are observable and observed, that are observable and then observed in some instances. And then you could generalize this by induction. Uh, so, um, you have to deal all the way through with the observable properties. Now, what is a causal law? Uh, I wrote a paper some time ago with Blondeau, uh, and uh, unfortunately, who, who is now working uh, in uh, yeah, no, he quit a private company, he's working with the university, uh, the, the VUB in Brussels. Okay, so according to us, a causal law is a universal proposition that mentions a time variation of some properties, the effect, 
and the other terms in the in the law uh, refer to the cause. Um, and this is in line with the neo million empiricist regulative view of causation. Uh, you can verify this kind of law by means of the million methods of uh, agreement and, uh, and, uh, and, and difference. The important thing is that, again, that in those, in those uh, laws, you must be able to detect empirically, uh, to ascertain empirically the presence of properties which are denoted by the terms uh, in, in the laws. And the effect, the effect again, is denoted, well, Intuitively, the effect is uh, a variation, okay? a change, uh, a modification of some property, uh, a change in the course of events, an event, an event between a space-time instantiation of property of a property or some properties. So this is uh, denoted in the in the context of a of a in mathematical sciences in a formula by a deriv derivative or passion derivative and things like that. And the other terms uh, are referred to the uh, purported uh, causes of those uh, effects. And uh, those terms denote real uh, properties if those properties are again observable in principle and have been immediately observed or more often detected. So that you have been able to, so that, that you are able to uh, empirically and inductively verify the cause of law. Okay. Let's new, now look at some examples of truth tropic arguments. And in, an inference to the presence of an unseen mouse, which is discussed in Van Frassen's book, uh, 1980. The scientific image, and uh, he criticizes, of course, uh, uh, inference to the best explanation, but not specifically this one, because this one has to do with properties which are observable in principle. Okay, um, and uh, the other argument is the inference to the existence of Neptune, which are taken, those two examples are taken to be classical examples of inference to the best explanation or abduction. Uh, in the Stanford Encyclopedia, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, if you look at the term abduction, abduction, the inference to the existence of Neptune, that's the example which is extensively discussed by Igor Duven, who is a well-known specialist uh, on, on, on abduction. Okay, so, so the challenge now for us is to reconstruct those arguments as deductive arguments from premises, uh, well, as all arguments uh, from premises and with a conclusion. So we need to reconstruct those arguments from inductively confirmed premises, stating causal connections, some premises. Uh, state causal connections. Now, a brief terminological remark. Induction here is taken in a restrictive sense because <coughs> some authors, they use the word induction to refer to all kinds of empirative inference. That is, an inference whose conclusion has a content which goes beyond the content of the premises. Okay, so here I, I take induction in a in a restrictive sense, not any kind. I'm not I'm not meaning any kind of empirical uh, 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 inference. So I mean arguments of the kind. Well, a raven A is uh, black. A raven B is black. A raven C is black. Therefore, all a ravens are black. And of course. Uh, these arguments do not provide any certainty, right? They didn't provide any certainty. <coughs> okay. So let's look at the 
abductive form of the argument in favor of the existence of a mouse uh, at home. Okay. So we start from an absurd fact. There, are gray, there is gray hair uh, on the floor, cheese disappears, specific uh, little noises are heard. Okay, that's the first uh, premise which states and uh, which describes immediate <coughs> empirical evidence and description of facts. Then the hypothesis H is the following, the presence of a mouse in the house best explains, best explains uh, the facts F. Okay, best explanation. Suppose this is the best explanation according to any criterion of explanation again. <coughs> so, and that is the conclusion, H is likely to be true. There is a mouse in the house, okay? So, I do not claim that this is a bad argument, okay? I do not claim that this is a bad argument. I simply claim, as I'll try to show, simply claim that this argument, which is good, huh, is good because it relies on a hidden, not mentioned uh, premise. And this premise is a premise that states a, um, uh, is a empirically but there are two premises, they are empirically attested by induction. Okay. So what I, what I will propose is a reconstruction of the argument, which is deductive. Huh? So that's not that, well, of course, abduction is, is deductive, but uh, uh, which is a deductive defense, uh, uh, a bottom-up uh, argument, which starts from empir empir empirically, empirically verified premises. Okay. Right. Let's go. So by definition, a mouse is an animal with four legs, a long tail, small ears, a pink snout, etc. The word mouse, like the word table, functions as an abbreviation huh, of a set of properties which are associated, <coughs> which go together. Huh? Because instead of uh, speaking of something uh, which is uh, hard, uh, four legs that can be used to eat. Mm -hmm. We use the word table. Right? So these terms, of course, uh, again, uh, this, we can discuss this, but uh, these many terms in the language, uh, uh, table, mouse, uh, the function like abbreviations. Uh, uh, but I am in good company with this, you know, Russell, uh, um, Armstrong, uh, so on. I mean, there are many philosophers who have defended this. <clears throat> and we have uh, previously directly observed in this case that the animals that shed gray hair, eat cheese, make some typical noises, etc., also possess the other properties of the animals we call mice. To shed gray hair, eat cheese, make some typical noises, also possess the other properties namely having four legs, a long tail, small ears, uh, pink snout, etc. Such constant association between properties is empirically and observationally ascertained by induction. We observe a certain number you know, of animals which have all those properties. So having some properties that gray hair and also Causal properties in the sense that is shedding gray hair, eating cheese, those are processes. Huh? Those are processes, the disappearance of cheese is caused by the, the mouse eating the cheese. Okay. So uh, those constant causal correlations between some events, uh, uh, disappearance of cheese and, uh, and eating cheese by, by mice, have been observed and that can be attested by the methods of agreement and difference. So, 
uh, gray hair on the ground, the disappearance of cheese regularly occur after the loss of gray hair and the ingestion of cheese. And these are causal processes. Observation previously taught us, before we make that argument, huh, is there a new, is there a new mouse in my house? Okay, is there a new? We have seen mice, we have seen mice, but is there, is there a new one? Observation previously taught us that mice defined as above and only mice have properties as gray hair loss, etc. Causally correlated or connected with the instantiation of directly observed properties, gray hair on the floor, etc. By induction, on the basis of previous observations of mice, we conclude that the latter properties, the properties that we have on the floor, etc., are clues, clues to the presence of a mouse. So these clues give us better reasons to believe in the existence of a mouse. Of course, if we directly the observations, uh, the patient observation, if we directly observe the mouse, the mouse, then we reinforce. Huh? the belief in the existence of the mouse in the house. We have thus detected the presence of something that has certain properties, gray hair, etc. And uh, this is an indirect observation in the mouse. Indirect observation in the sense that uh, it is based on those causal connections. I know that this is a rather uh, stretched uh, ex meaning. I stretch a little bit the, uh, the, 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 the meaning, the usual meaning of the word observation here. So relying on an inductively previously verified statement, we can claim that observed facts, the clues are causally connected with some unobserved OP properties. They are observable, huh? of course, otherwise we couldn't have verified the causal connections that we claim are true, uh, unobserved OP, OP properties. And therefore, we have more reasons to believe the presence of a mouse that possesses the properties causally connected with the clues, as well as other <coughs> properties, the properties which, uh, uh, you know, uh, are the associated properties, and uh, later direct observation of the mass will, of course, strengthen our belief in its existence. So we have this for the following reconstruction. Maybe uh, I'm a bit insisting on that, but uh, I want to, to make those things clear. Uh, so we have first premise facts F, the gray hair on the floor, etc. We have second premise inductively directly verified causal relations C. Um, the facts mentioned in premise one are causally connected with the presence of an entity that sheds gray hair, eats cheese, and makes specific noises. Three, an inductively directly verified association A. Entities that shed gray hair, etc., also have the associated properties of being four legged animals with a pink snout, etc. Conclusion: A mouse is present, which is not a certain, which is not a. We are not, never certain of the truth of that, but because these, the two premises, there are two premises which are, we are we are not even absolutely certain of the facts F, but we are certainly not certain of the inductively uh, verified premises because there are inductions here, and so uh, induction is an intuitive uh, reasoning. Okay. This conclusion is reached because the presence of the mouse provides the best or loveliest explanation of the observations, but because we make a deductive inference from previously directly observed causal connections and an association of properties characteristic of specific entities also directly observed previously. Okay. We also have a premium bonus, so to speak, a lovely explanation of facts. Uh, of course, we have a lovely explanation of facts. The presence of a mouse does explain uh, nicely 
nicely why we observe uh, gray hair on the floor, etc. We have an explanation, but the we have this this explanation because premise C, which is that is that is a causal process, is a causal explanation provides the basis of a causal explanation here. It's a kind of explanation. There might be other kinds of explanation, but here we have an explanation. Huh? A causal explanation. We relate the the effects of the effects to a, uh, a cause. Uh, the argument for the presence of a mass is deductive and logically valid. If the premises FC and A are true, this argument in, is sound and also provides a correct explanation of the of the phenomena. So we do have an explanation, but it's not the explanatory power, the loveliest, the loveliness of that explanation, which is uh, um, behind, uh, which uh, grounds, which grounds the conclusion that uh, there is a house present uh, in a mouse present in the house. Objection. <coughs> of course, there are objections. Uh, always objections in philosophy. This deductive argument isn't convincing because we still must check that in this specific case, we do have an occurrence of the alleged cause of connection. Okay. We know that there are causal connections. I huh? suppose that in general there are causal connections. But here, you know, you have the gray hair, you have the, the, the specific noise, etc. Uh, and we know that mice are such and such and that's that. But in this case, what evidence do we have that there is this uh, causal connection? The causal connection between this gray hair and this mouse in the house. Okay? That's the crux of the matter huh? here. Okay. Well, there might be other causes of, of the phenomena. Huh? That's a typical objection of the inference to the best explanation as well. There might be other causes. But here, since uh, uh, I want to be uh, non explanatory, then I have to reply to those objections of the alternative uh, uh, explanations, not on the basis of the explanatory power. Okay. All right, to be coherent, huh? hopefully. OK, so there might be other causes, uh, like uh, maybe a rat. Okay. A, roll, huh? a rat, they have gray hair, you know, they make noise, and they, they eat cheese, and they eat anything, but, uh, including cheese and so on. All right. Uh, or the, a neighbor, a neighbor, you know, who doesn't like me for whatever reason, um, manages to have a copy of the key of my house, and when I away, he puts uh, those. Uh, uh, he has mice at home, and he put gray hair on the floor, and uh, uh, he he put cheese, and the, the day after he made the cheese disappear, and things like that. I mean, you can imagine other uh, explanatory stories uh, at the, that may explain the evidence. Okay, but you eliminate. We can eliminate uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, alternative hypotheses not on the basis of uh, inferior explanatory power, but on the basis, again, of experience. Because what you say, look, the rats, they, ha they don't have that kind of gray hair. Uh, we have seen that, uh, and they don't make those little noises that we have heard before produced by mice. So we can discard. Uh, we cannot, of course, discard any uh, Unconceived alternative, uh, the, the word inconceived alternative expression, which uh, always uh, often comes uh, comes in this kind uh, of discussion. But that doesn't matter in a way because maybe there are conceived alternatives. But uh, what are they? Well, give me one. Huh? If, if you, you say simply it's possible that you have other alternatives, then uh, maybe we can, we can discard them. And of course, we are not into the certainty. There is no certainty. There might be. Alternatives, but we are in a position. Do we have good reasons now, on the basis of the evidence that we have now, to have more reasons to believe in the existence of the most rather, rather than not? Okay. So uh, we can also eliminate the, the, 
the the hypothesis of the malevolent uh, neighbor because he's very nice and so on and so on and I have a, a security key and you know and things like that again those those beliefs which are grounded on inductive empirical uh, experience, uh, 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 reasoning another objection I, there's some say the IBE in France, the best explanation is just the following. The best explanation is the one which is the likeliest to be true. Okay. So a genuine IBE is the one which is uh, inferring likeliness from loveliness. Okay. But if you pick the likeliest explanation as the best one, then you get a circular argument. Again, okay. The, 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 uh, this is discussed by, nicely by Lipton in his book. Uh, the, what, what you want as an explanationist, what you want is, a, is, a, is an argument that, that goes from an internal property of a theory, that is its explanatory power, its loveliness, to something which is not in intrinsic but extrinsic, external, that is, its likeliness to be true, huh? to fit reality, to fit the facts, okay? If you say that the best explanation is likeliest, then you, you, you don't have, a, perhaps you have a, an inference to the best explanation, we are not <coughs> discussing terminology issues here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> You don't have an interesting argument. What you want is to, to go from loveliness to loveliness. And there is a problematic connection between loveliness and truth. That's the point of Voltaire's objection. And as I try to show, the elimination of alternative explanation follows from lack, lack of empirical evidence or falsification. Uh, lack of empirical data, or that there is falsification which is based on observations. Well, to conclude, let's briefly look at the Neptune's example. To recall, at the beginning 19th century, a French uh, uh, astronomer, Bouvard, detected by means of a telescope that the planet Uranus had anomalies in its trajectory, in the sense that its trajectory did not conform classical mechanics, even if we take into account the other known planets, typically the biggest one, Jupiter, and uh, the anomalies couldn't be caused by a comet, because the comet is tiny and then doesn't have a motion. Uh, you could make uh, an alternative uh, uh, explanatory hypothesis, I come back to that, uh, but this has a heuristic road, and then you check <coughs> whether it works empirically. Okay? but not on the basis of loveliness. Come back to that again. Since the laws of classical mechanics had been widely confirmed, Adams and Le Verrier concluded that an unknown planet caused the anomalies. Of course, you could say, well, that's a falsification of, of uh, Newton's laws, but since uh, uh, Newton, Newtonian mechanics had been confirmed by Many uh, in many instances, that was rather uh, unplausible to put into question uh, Newtonian physics. And in 1846, the visible properties of a planet called Neptune were observed by telescope by a German uh, astronomer, Johann Galle, in its uh, predicted location. Okay, planets. So we have to start with definitions. Uh, with the definition of planets, because as we started from the definition of a mouse in the previous example. So planets are observationally defined as light points that seen from Earth move periodically around the constellations of the zodiac. Okay. According to classical mechanics, the planets also revolve around the Sun, have mass, speed and acceleration. Their motion is described by Newton's laws. Relying on Newton's inductively verified cause of laws, we can infer from the effect, the anomalies, its cause, 
the motion of an unknown massive body, a planet whose motion conforms classical mechanics. And then we have the following reconstruction. Fact F, anomalies in the trajectory of Uranus. We have inductively verified correlations. According to Newtonian theory, anomalies are causally uh, uh, related to some massive body. Okay. Inductive elimination of alternatives E, other hypothetical causal connections with comets already known planets are not empirically verified. Okay. Association A, the properties of mass visibility and periodic motion around the sun define what a planet is. Conclusion, a new planet, Neptune, probably exists. And we have a further confirmation detection at the predicted positions. So again, we do not rely on the uh, uh, explanatory power uh, of the hypothesis of a new planet to conclude that this new planet is likely present, but we rely on inductively uh, confirmed causal laws, Newton's laws, and associations, observed associations in the case of, of, uh, uh, of planets. And this is a bottom-up approach in favor of the existence of this new, as yet unobserved uh, planet. Now, I do not deny, of course, that abductive reasonings are useful. Uh, because abductive reasoning does help in framing new hypotheses. Why not? Huh? You can always imagine, you know, new hypotheses or new theories, provided they are empirically adequate, that uh, would provide a nice, according to a criterion, your criterion, an explanation of phenomena. That's not prohibited, of course. It's, but it has a heuristic value only. Does not have a, 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 a truth conducive ability. Simply, it helps you to it helps you to it helps you to uh, frame new hypotheses. Then the, those hypotheses you will see whether it fits the phenomena. If it's very empirically verified by the phenomena, you see. Oh, maybe it's a comet. Fine. This is not, of course, a stupid uh, uh, hypothesis, but then you see, well, what, are, what, are the, what is the mass of a comet? Typically, we have observed previously that comets have very, a very small mass, and this very small mass, and they have a certain kind of motion, and then you, you, you put that in the framework of, the, of Newtonian mechanics, you calculate, and then you see, well, it doesn't work. Huh? So you put it aside. That's not an, an abductive reasoning. That's a, to check whether a proposition is true on the basis of observation. You do not uh, rely on the good explanatory uh, purported or alleged uh, explanatory power of the hypothesis of a comet. Okay. And also, such abductive reasoning is guided by background knowledge. Background knowledge. That is what you know, what you know, physics or science knows. What, well, the knowledge that science provides you about what's what's going on in the world. You cannot frame anything. You cannot frame. You cannot suppose that uh, uh, a god or Martians or uh, or the miracles you know occurred. That's something that uh, it uh, discarded beforehand huh, on the basis of previous broad experience, huh, which is encapsulated in the background knowledge that you that you have. Okay, well, PT properties, of course, these are beyond the pale. Conclusion. Allegedly explanatory virtues are not conducive to truth. Explanatory loveliness is not truth topic. 
If a theory has the virtue of containing empirically and inductively verified causal laws, we can deductively infer the existence of causes that are observable in principle and that may be detected later from observed effects. Then, in this case, we have more reasons to believe in the reality of these causes than uh, not. Okay, that is it. thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions. Just before the question, we should take a few minutes to change the air. That's the okay. reasonable thing to do, but very short time. Mm. Just open the windows a little, a few minutes. You open on your side. Slides. Oops, sorry. Should okay. put back your slides. Come so to pour our opponent to slides to do. Charles, est-ce que tu vois les slides? Bon, Charles est plus là. OK. Donc, je pense qu'on peut faire okay. une question maintenant. Là, la bouge. Vous voulez? Non, non, non. À moins que les gens soient gelés, on peut laisser. Ouais. Euh, on fait ce qu'on a. Vous avez des questions sur le consignage Euh. C'est un langage de question. Ah non. Euh. Euh. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just one question, because I'm not sure. You... Uh, excuse me. Do you think it's uh, possible that uh, people like, remove uh, their mask when they ask a question? My mask just for the time I ask the question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure about one thing. So you showed that abduction could be replaced by a deduction based on inductive premises. Uh, but is am I right in thinking that you did you claim that this is only possible for observable uh, unobserved yet observable properties? Right. Yes. Because I do think this would not work for uh, spins and things like that. Is, is that the case? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In that case, we need argument to this explanation for spin senses. No, in that case, uh, I think that we we ought to be agnostic about the existence of spin of okay. particles. Even if we argument to this explanation does not work either for for, for these kind of uh, properties. No, because the no because the uh, inference to the best explanation is no. This is the Voltaire's objection. So you posit, of course you can posit the existence of a spin of a particle to account for some experiments, uh, you know, back in those bits, you know, these things. For the electron, fine, you can do that. But then, since, since, uh, the, the, uh, because of the Voltaire objection, so you have a nice explanation, and I don't dispute, that's a nice explanation. If you posit the existence of a spin, etc., and uh, it can also has heuristic values and things like that. Fine. I, uh, I don't think the philosopher is a is a censor, you know, and then 
is a big, it's, it's policeman uh, uh, that you know is on the shoulder of a scientist and says, you know, no, you 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 ought not to speak about spit anymore because uh, it, it uh, you have no reason to believe that it really exists, right? but. So the, the Voltaire object, objection applies to that because you, the, the only way you can argue in favor of the existence of these purely theoretical, theoretical properties is explan, explanatory power. And then explanatory power does not give you the leverage uh, to go out to, to reality because again of Voltaire's objection. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, we might like to regret that, but uh, regret is not uh, it's a subjective feeling, it's psychological, it doesn't have any uh, truth uh, conducive uh, power either. And uh, this, I, I think, uh, it's, uh, it, you, you are to be anti-realist uh, philosophically about the existence uh, of uh, spits if, if the, these, these objections, what their objection, uh, against uh, abduction holds, holds. Yeah. Because since spin is a PT property and which is transcendent, so to speak, there is no way you can ascertain that there is a causal connection between the property of having a spin on the one hand and other properties which would be the effect of the, this having a spin. You can, of course, observe Purported, uh, supposed, supposed effects, but you cannot detect the presence of the of the spin by means uh, uh, of other of other laws uh, which have been previously uh, verified, inductively verified, because it's impossible. It's impossible because the spin is not an observable property. Yeah. That's I my was, point. I'm yeah. thinking about that. So if Spin is the best explanation. The existence of spin is yeah. the best explanation of some phenomena, some observable phenomena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also the best explanation of another observable phenomenon and another one. Then we have different reasons. Uh, I mean, this is the best explanation for several phenomena. Yeah. And so we can perhaps back up. The, 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 the one argument of explanation by another one. Yeah. And in that case, perhaps uh, there is some, it, it's just not one um, phenomenon. I mean, the, the only reason you have is that relation to that phenomenon. Okay. As an explanation of that phenomenon. Okay. But you also have other reasons, and that, in that case, is it not a bit stronger? Than, uh, I don't think so, because uh, uh, if you have a bad argument and you repeat that bad, bad argument in some uh, uh, other instances, you still have a global bad argument. Uh, if if you, you, you think that uh, the inference to the best explanation is not true the topic for the reasons I tried to, 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 to show, then you can have... Uh, it certainly shows that the pos positing the existence of a spin is a very useful in science. Huh? And you can work pragmatically in this case. Pragmatically, there's <coughs> some virtue, pragmatic virtue. I'm not uh, disputing the pragmatic virtue of uh, of the of the of positing the existence of a spin, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, the fact that uh, it works in several instances, uh, then uh, it, uh, it certainly uh, it gives good reasons to believe in the pragmatic utility of the post. Do you give a good reason to believe in the pragmatic utility of spin? And what about if there is some empirically uh, uh, backed uh, observation that, uh, I mean, uh, law that uh, the, the several phenomena which are explained by spin are uh, correlated? So they appear together. So they seem to be linked because we have. There is some reason to, to, to think that there are links okay. to each other. That's, that's, that's we have no explanation except. Yeah, yeah that's the that the, 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 the that's the uh, typical argument uh, used by Reckenbach in the principle of the common cause, right? 
uh, you have a, you have a say okay uh, then uh, uh, it seems that you have a common cause and uh, yeah that that's true but since you have no reason to believe that in each particular instance the cause is this one it's not empirically verified you also don't have any reason to believe that there is exist this common cause of course a consequence of this of the argumentation i didn't say that but that's a good point the, the, this kind of uh, inference to the, co uh, the common cause principle, which is used by Reichenbach, who is considered to be an empiricist after all, but which is criticized by Van Fransen, as you probably know, uh, then the, uh, the, 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 the principle of the common cause is not acceptable for someone who doesn't believe in abduction or inference of the basic condition. Uh, that's, a, that's a consequence, yes. Mm -hmm. You cannot believe in the principle of the common cause and uh, be against abduction. Yeah. So the first paper. Yeah, I have several things, but um, thank you for this talk. Uh, really interesting uh, uh, thoughts. You can remove uh, your then, mask. If you want yes, sure. <laughs> um, I want to say something in, in well, um, as a sort of uh, adding to what, what, what Bruno said. Um, it seems to me that uh, while it's kind of almost obviously true that uh, because something is uh, has some explanatory virtues, you cannot conclude from that that it, that there's some there's no you cannot say that it's true or or whatever. I mean, but um, there might be it's not implausible to say that. You can say something that uh, gives us reasons to believe certain stuff about truth. Not per se that it's true, but uh, that it's more likely or something. Uh, because our the things we know about the, the heuristics or the, 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 the normative features of explanatoriness, they have developed for a reason. I mean, we have we have learned that by these kinds of explanation, we get successful. Uh, a scientific practice, which is mostly an empirical uh, uh, undertaking. So, um, like you could have some kind of uh, uh, evolution argument or something that selects for the best uh, uh, norms for explanation. The, the best in the sense that it like has the most chance of getting to truth. So that could be a way to to say that well probably are the best tools we have now to come to explanations actually have some really might have as good reason to believe that they have some more likelihood to get to truth than um, things that are not good explanations uh, so i don't know whether it's an entirely internal i mean it's mostly internal and, and there's nothing like with absolute certainty to say that it gets you to truth but it might be that, I mean, it evolved, evolved in such a way that it, there's a slightly better chance. Uh, hmm. It's not unrelated to the truth. It's not completely coherent, this thing. Uh, OK, well, the absolute certainty, it's a will of the wisp, as we all agree on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that, if I understood correctly, you um, explained uh, quite convincingly why people believe uh, in some abductive explanations and their and their conclusion. Okay, so what you you gave it seems to be it's a naturalistic uh, yeah. um, account of some beliefs. Fine, that's fine. With me. And uh, it is true that uh, when we uh, propose an explanation, we propose an explanation. This explanation is based on most in most cases on some statements or propositions which are by and large inductively empirically confirmed in that so that, that's what i mentioned the background knowledge so it's not an explanation the explanations that i propose are not out of the blue <coughs> they are plausible and their plausibility their plausibility is based is based on what we previously observed okay so that's why i said the argument in favor of the existence of uh, 
mouse is not considered as a bad argument by Balfrasen, okay? Because the explanation that is provided is at the end of the day based on empirically verified and inductively uh, correlations and associations, okay? But if you want to, by that kind of argument, infer the existence of spin and things like that, you don't have a sufficiently solid background knowledge, solid in the sense, again, empirically buttressed uh, to sustain the existence of these purely theoretical properties. Yeah, well, it, I'm, I know there is just a, by analogy, I mean, a scientific realist, they say, okay, well, scientists use that argument, adductive argument, which is true, okay, and uh, uh, deposit entities, the existence of entities like Neptune, huh? and uh, that works finely. So why not extend this kind of argument huh, to purely theoretical properties like spin, charm, uh, strangeness, and things like that? But that's, I think, it's, it's sophism, because uh, it's uh, you are. It's true that the form seems to, the the form of the argument seems to be the same, but the the nature of the premises or the hidden premises that you are relying upon are not is not the same. It's not empirically grounded. Enough empirically grounded. Yes. Thank you. I have some other questions. Um, Alexander, is there somebody else? Okay, sure. Pierre was before me. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I have many questions, but I will ask one. Okay. Uh, I will ask one and after that, maybe later. So, your argument relies a lot on the fact that causality, causal law, are, are <coughs> dynamical laws, or physical dynamical laws. And so, it, it, when you have this conception of causality, it's, it's easy to exclude common cause arguments and all that. But of course, most scientists today defend some kind of manipulation account of causality, like Pearl, like where where the the principle of common cause is at the basic of the construction. So, so they cannot get around. They cannot say it's not yeah. there. It's 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 an axiom of all the, the research of causal, of causal relations. Mm -hmm. So would you not say that at least in certain contexts when it's related to observable uh, problems, since, since the, the ground research, the, the basic research of causal relations is based on this axiom, or is it is it also an inference to this explanation that I'm doing without no, um, I'm not, uh, should I'm not familiar with uh, what you mentioned, but uh, I tend to believe that uh, the uh, manipulability, well, I've, I'm not sure I will be able to answer to your question uh, in a very uh, complete and accurate way, but, you know, just a few remarks. First of all, um, I tend to believe that manipulability is, uh, is based on causal laws. If you are able to manipulate, then there are some causal laws operating that you might be ignore. Huh? But I know that if I uh, there is a good inductive uh, support that if I take this glass and I put it around, you know, it will uh, go the way uh, I want it to. I don't know what the, the causal laws are behind that. I don't, well, not all of them, but there are some of them, but not all of them, of course. First remark. A second remark. Um, the principle of the common cause is perfectly uh, valid if the common cause is observable in principle. Uh, that's I would, that what I would reply. But if it's not, then uh, I'm, I'm rather skeptical about that. But if you, I would be interested to, you know, to, to, to have some uh, reference in the literature about, about that. Yeah. But just, just to add, uh, you're right that it's quite possible that many of the manipulation account is grounded in in, in more processual causal law. This is the position of Peter, for example. <laughs> but but it's not a proof. We don't know that. We we no. postulate that there there's a nice argument of Lewis to say it could be true. By, so, by so Lewis, 
David always explained how even the fact that the manipulation account seems directional is not proving exactly that, but it's proving that for counterfactual. So you could have you could have directional causality that is grounded in uh, um, in reversible laws. It's quite possible to be shows up formally. Yeah, but but why not? But we don't know. We don't know. It's an hypothesis. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We cannot check for our cases. And you're right that it's true that most of the research I have in mind, like Pearl, like all these guys that are building huge model of causal to discover causal relation in disease and complex factors in the economy, it's always related to observable. Mm. Always observable variables. They don't talk about what would be non-observable. So in that case, you would say, okay. This principle could be could be used because it has some empirical uh, support. strength yeah. support. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I have other questions, but I will leave for the chat. Thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. So I, I just have a you, uh, oh, uh, sorry, but <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we'll have to select one question. But uh, uh, so I will. So it's a small, a small point about uh, the Mars example. So perhaps if you could please go back to the slide uh, where you present uh, the example, and especially I want to draw your attention about um, the claim you made uh, to the effect that we have uh, observational evidence that only mice can cause those uh, effects on those observable which is something I intuitively resist a little bit. And I think it's related to the problem of unconcealed alternatives. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, well, I took the example of temperature because I, I have already presented the example of the mask here in, in several seminaries. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you have to distinguish uh, between inertia and gravitational mass. Huh? So let's take. Uh, I asked uh, the mouse, the mouse example, not the mask. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I just asked. No, that's what I mean. I understood mass. No, no, sorry. Okay. The mouse, sorry, sorry, the sorry. Mouse example. Sorry. Uh, I think you that. Is that? Is that a slide you wanted? No, it's, I think it's, it's a slide with more text. Uh, <coughs> yes, yes, that's the one. So the third paragraph observation previously told us that mice, defined as above, and only mice have properties as gray hairs. And I'm curious about how you. If I push you, say, how do you know by observation that only mice, uh, uh, I would say, well, you, you should know by observation. Uh, okay, that mice. okay, 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 okay. Well, that's a uh, that's a that's a good point. Yes. Okay, I should drop the word uh, only that uh, on the basis of our uh, experience so far, uh, we uh, claim that uh, we. There could be other animals uh, which uh, resemble very much uh, mice, and uh, but uh, which differ from mice with respect to some other property. And then, uh, okay, I agree. But I don't think that changes, you know, the uh, the, the the point because uh, if uh, uh, you say uh, mice, uh, we have observed that mice are that, and then someone would say, well, of course, there might be other animals. Huh? But that is the, the unconceived alternative uh, issue. And then what you have to do is to, to contradict me if I claim that there is a mouse in the house, um, that uh, there is another, there are other animals that have been observed and they have the exact same properties as the ones, uh, as the clues that uh, we have observed, and but they differ from mice with respect to other properties, for example, they have a black snout or something like that. Yeah. But I, I, okay, I agree, I think that's a, that's a good point, yes. Can I have a, a very short follow-up? 
First, so I, I anticipated that we fall back on the problem of unconceived alternatives, and your, your solution to it is to bring, like, if I understood correctly, is to bring some probabilistic considerations so that the, 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 of, the, of the available hypothesis, the one about mice, but mice is the most probable rather than no. No, it's, it's simply more reasons to believe. We have more reasons to believe. That is, uh, uh, oh, I quite agree that there is the indetermination thesis, and there are possible alternatives that are unconceived, unconceived alternatives, but unconceived but, but conceivable, right? Uh, I quite agree that there is that there is this possibility, but. They, they cannot be taken into consideration because they are simply put on the table, so to speak. And then we cannot check whether empirically whether we cannot check whether they are uh, true or not. I stick to what you are though. So until you provide me an alternative, I don't, don't need to take yeah. it into account. I don't even need to put the probability if I understand correctly. Uh, because probability will be trying to guess about things that I don't oh, know. I thought that uh, at some point you introduced the idea that uh, you, you take the, the most likely or... Uh, yeah, oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, yeah. I, should perhaps, I should perhaps be more yeah. careful about the word likely. So this, yeah. Uh, we lack absolute certainty because certainty, the possibility of uh, of other alternatives, jeopardize the certainty that you can have about your conclusion. But uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't speak in terms of probability okay. or likeliness. But uh, uh, I spoke of likeliness because the premises are not like are not are not uh, absolutely certain. Perhaps the example is a bit idealized, but I suppose in many cases we have, uh, uh, so we know that there are various things that could cause, like, pieces of evidence, like uh, the mice and stuff. And even though, it's so, so okay, there are some, like, purely imaginative hypotheses which just hook up a possible explanation that doesn't correspond to anything that has been observed before. But if you do, like, like criminal forensics, you know, some criminals, so planting evidence, something that has already happened. Something that happens, we have observed in the past. So it seems that what, uh, what the difference between the hypothesis that evidence was planted or uh, the hypothesis that uh, actually the criminal that manifestly did the thing actually did it is something that has to do with, uh, since you mentioned likeliness, I would say that you introduce some sort of high covered probability reasoning. But it's probably not, so it's fair to put the question, perhaps it's not what you have in mind, but if that's if that's the kind of thing that you lean towards, then I'm not sure that the, the, the argument that you provide instead of uh, in the best explanation is actually a purely deductive argument. It seems more like a probabilistic argument, but is it just... No, like, it's a, it's, I think it's a deductive argument, but uh, uh, I, I use the word likely in the sense of Lipton. You know, okay. it's uh, that uh, it's, I mean, it's not sure, but it's more certain uh, or less uncertain uh, it's, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's true because it's uh, but it's true that you could introduce the probability at the level of some premises uh, because they are inductively uh, addressed uh, I don't know why, how and, uh, but uh, that's a huge uh, topic <laughs> Uh, yeah. I have a follow-up just to uh, yes. So, so the, this is to do with the, the premise, of the inductively obtained premise of the elimination of the alternatives, right? This only... Sorry, I, I, sorry, I, I just uh, uh, write something. Okay, sorry. So this word only mice here is not like it's important for because you have this premise of the elimination of alternatives, and this only mice is supposed to do that, right? It's 
uh, uh, not the, your neighbor who's playing tricks on you. It's only mice that have. Uh, uh, yes, yes, um, yes, yes. And but I, I wonder whether this is really part of the. I mean, and then you get to the elimination of the alternatives by empirical verification. But this is not part of the usual abduction process. That's afterwards. You 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 have you have you look for some explanations, probably the best ones, and then you gonna you go check back to nature and check which ones right. are good. Right. But that's already a second phase of the. I mean, that's not part of the same argument. I would say against no, no. the the ampliative process, and then you have to go back to nature to to go to to to. I agree. I agree. So the the first part is heuristic. I see. Yeah, the first part is heuristic. You propose a hypothesis or a possible explanation, but then you cannot infer the truth or the 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 the, the, the well. The, you cannot infer that this explanation is is more likely to be true than uh, uh, another one. You have to make the second step. In order to be to have a good reasons or more reasons to believe in the truth of that explanation, mm -hmm. because uh, you gave the example with the comets uh, and I, the comets, the comets right. and, and I didn't think that was very convincing because the reason why you dismiss a comet as the explanation for which Uranus or um, Jupiter, Neptune, um, yeah, but but. but you have to explain not Neptune. You have to explain the, the movement of another planet, which was was the Jupiter. Uranus. 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 Uranus okay. yeah. So I was yeah. right. Uranus. <laughs> Uranus. Yeah, anomalies in the uh, trajectories of yeah, Uranus. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one. And then um, so you you frame some hypotheses, yes. right? Like another unknown planet or or Jupiter. You have to take into account maybe Saturn. Uh, uh, you, or perhaps there are comets. Uh, yeah, but uh, the comet thing is specific because there the reason why you dismiss it is not so much empirical, but there is already a theoretical reason that comets don't get this. No, size it's, a, it's, and it's so empirical on. because you you eliminate the comets on the basis of uh, empirically verified of, of of the properties of comets. For example, typically they have very small mass. Uh, and, and and second thing is that uh, uh, you, based on the on Newton's laws, uh, you, you you insert the mass of the comet and you see whether you can on the basis of the of Newton's law you can correlate the mass and the trajectory of a comet with the deviation of the trajectory of Uranus and it does work. Okay, but there's a quite a difference between um, like this sort of more theoretical work uh, why you can dismiss comets and um, and seeing that um, I mean going afterwards and, and, and check for, uh, empirically that certain potential explanations do not work uh, you can do this in advance uh, without any new knowledge say well it's unlikely that it's a comet because the comets we've seen are such and such while with the mice uh, you might have to check um, whether your neighbor can have been inside of your house uh, or no, um, like the, the, it seems very important whether you verify after you've done the abduction process um, empirically or you do this like as a premise of the abduction reasoning. Um, and in the comment case, it seems to be a premise that allows you to eliminate, while in the case of your neighbor putting um, uh, 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 fake evidence of mice in your house, it might be more an afterwards thing, another premise yeah, but the of point, you know, The point with the comet, the point, I, I agree that there is a difference, but, uh, uh, but uh, with the neighbor, but uh, the point is that uh, to discard, to discard the comet, huh? and uh, to discard the, as you discard the malevolent neighbor, you based your uh, elimination on some empir empirically verified mm -hmm. causal relationships. I agree. Okay, but of course, uh, the causal relationships you rely upon to eliminate a comet is more theoretical than in the case of the neighbor, of course, because it's Newton mechanics. But the point is that the, these are in both cases those causal connections. 
these hypothetical causal connections are not addressed by observation. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh... All right, it's four o'clock. But we we can delay by my fault. So if if Michelle agree, you you can continue ten minutes or for sure. sure. Yeah, it, it's your choice. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure I understand. Ba ballet mask. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I understand the, well the observa observable in principle, the scope of this of this notion. Because let let me give you an example. So you understand and you also agree, or you understand I'm, but I'm you disagree. Sure. I, I, try, I try to understand the extent because if I understand correctly, using your distinction, you would make a difference between the inference for the existence of Neptune and the the inference for the existence of um, neutrinos, which were also based on observable anomalies that were. It's a bit, so, sorry, I, uh, maybe you, I interrupt you because <coughs> you, you, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm a realist about some pro <coughs> some properties, you know, some properties. Okay, so the the neutrino, it's it's always it's again a name. What are the properties of neutrinos? What and uh, what is the pro a property which is typical of a neutrino? And only neutrino, which is observable in principle, and which is connected to uh, observation. Typically, I would say energy. Mm -hmm. Energy is an observable, in the wide sense, is an observable property. Okay. Okay. And then, if you uh, uh, you have particles which have this amount of energy, such amount of energy. And it's this amount of energy is connected to, by means of laws, verified laws, to some observed properties. Then you have good, a good case for the existence of neutrinos. So it's by realism, it's a realism about instantiated properties. Okay. See. So, okay. So if the neutrinos and Neptune are very similar cases, according to what you just said, because they are based on causal laws, dynamical laws, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. your notion of causal laws that you presented here, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah years yeah. ago, I remember. <laughs> um, so, so why not include spin? So, so, so spin is detectable. Energy is detectable through quite almost direct means now. So, if you accept, what I try to understand is it's why you accept certain certain uh, certain instrument-driven properties and not others. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a good question uh, because because just to finish, I, I would be. Now, I think the detection of neutrinos, maybe not at the beginning, but now, is as calibrated as, as telescopes. You know, it took time, but now it's very calibrated. It's almost direct, almost in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. so, so, why? where do you cut? Because uh, I, I, the idea is this, is uh, uh, because Whatever, you know, the, even if you have a very big spin, I mean, internal spin, that would remain totally inaccessible to us. Of course, a very tiny amount of energy, like the amount of the energy of the, the neutrino, is also empirically inaccessible to us, right, directly. But different amounts of energy are empirically accessible. Us. So we can give a, an empirical meaning to the term energy, and we cannot do that with a, with a, with a, the word spin. Okay. So that's the idea. So in that case, you should look at the, there's a Newton's principle in the Principia that exactly argue for that. It, you, what you can observe, property that you can observe macroscopically, uh -huh. should exist at all scales. 
a property that you cannot observe microscopically, maybe they don't exist. That, but maybe, they, yeah, maybe, yeah. But that, that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, buy the fact that uh, if the property exists at some scale, it will, it will exist at large yeah, scale. Yeah, no, but but it's just, uh -huh. it's just. Where 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 does he write that? It's, it's called the analogy of nature. It's often translated yeah, as yeah. the analogy of nature in Latin. I forgot. Uh, yeah, okay. It's in the principle of uh, the good science in the third book. Yes, analogies of nature. Yes, yes. And I read that. It, a there, there's a long time ago. There's a, a, a long paper of the historian of physics about just what is the meaning exactly of that, and it's something about yeah. properties that. Are, I can attribute energy to very small thing because I can attribute energy to microscopic. Right, 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 right. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's uh, that's uh, with the uh, that's with uh, with the uh, agree with the paper. I, I can find it. The uh, historian. There's a good paper to explain because it's very it's two lines in Newton, but there's good historian to explain the context and why it should be some kind of. Uh, uh -huh. um, if you recall it's that, it's transduction, it's kind of an action from the macro. To yeah, the yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm really sympathetic with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay, okay thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <clears throat>